next <coughs> Sunday. So I'm very privileged to have got this opportunity. And I'm from Punjab's Central University of Punjab in Patinda. So I, I'll start with this famous quote from Darwin. So as you can see here, this is a bank, a river bank, a lot of diversity. You can see butterflies, you can see, you know, mouse, snail, you know, plants, animals, plants, microbes. Looks extremely complicated and extremely beautiful. But how are these related to each other? For example, a mouse, how it is related to a butterfly and a plant and a microbe. The beauty is that everything is connected like a tree-like fashion. Like a tree. This is a tree. This is what the theory of evolution of Charles Darwin. We are not simple, you know, unrelated entities. And we are not like a ladder on top of the ladder human being. No. We are all actually part of a big grand tree. You know, we can actually draw the diagram. So this is actually from Darwin's notebook. Charles Darwin's notebook. So you can see a tree. Were not D, B, C, A. All these are related. It could be A could be bacteria, B could be human being, C could be rice, D could be an algae. You know, all these are actually related. And the discipline to draw this tree is what you call phylogenetics. It's a sub-discipline of evolutionary biology. We use this particular technique to make the tree out of different animals, plants, or microbes. So this particular tool is extremely important to trace origin, geographical origin. I will show you that I use the same tool to trace origin of Tulsi. You know Tulsi? Yeah, yeah. Osimum sanctum or tenuiflorum is uh, the correct word for it now. So where exactly this Tulsi has started to distribute and trace a dispersal route for especially important for introduced species. Some species are basically for example Parthenium species. You know, it's basically introduced to India from South America and it's wrecking havoc to the local ecosystem. We can trace exactly the route in the in a map where exactly is coming from using this tool. While cryptic speciation, so this is actually the previously thought to be just one species, but inside one species, like Homo sapiens, right? We are Homo sapiens. Now a new study shows that Homo sapiens is actually two species. You know, that is called cryptic speciation, but that is not the case with Homo sapiens. But I discovered cryptic speciation in Ficus religiosa, you know. I will also come to that. Detect endemism. So endemism is the, you know, a term that we use. Some species occur only in some location. For example, in Antarctica, nowhere else you can find that species. That is called endemic species. So you can detect the endemism using the same tool. And also you can calculate the age. For example, exactly when this split happened, how many millions of years back. How many billions of years back this split happened? You can actually calibrate. That is called time calibration. All you can do, it's very, very powerful tool. And normally I work with DNA sequence. You know what DNA is, right? In cell, inside there is a nucleus, and inside there is this molecule. These are nucleo, nu you know, nucleic acids. DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid. So nucleic acid is like, you know, it's like letter. So this is a controlling molecule for us, right? It's like our brain for our body. It controls what a cell has to do, what kind of enzymes a cell has to make it. So this is the DNA. And we have to read, you know, that the letters of DNA encompasses only four, you know, alphabets. A, T, G, C. So sometimes A, G, G, T, C, C, like that. So each one code for a specific gene. So you need to sequence this particular DNA molecule for my study. I normally do the DNA sequencing in my lab, myself. So how does this sequencer work? I will just give you an overview. There is an enzyme that actually comes to this parent DNA. Like we have our own babies, right? I have two daughters. So from father, mother, a kid. Like that, this is the parent DNA, this is the daughter DNA. How it is formed? This enzyme hold here and it actually reads it. So these things are exactly, this enzyme is called DNA polymerase. This is a daughter DNA is being formed. Now there is a catch here in the sequencing reaction. This is a normal <coughs> scenario. The sequencing reaction you mix up with some of these fluorescently tagged nucleotide. These white ones are normal one. These are colored one are fluorescently labeled. Now this terminates. This is something called chain termination reaction. So whenever this fluorescent comes, it simply stops the chain. So if you give the parent DNA, uh, this terminates at different different length. 
right? Now you can actually think this as like swimmers wearing four different caps A, T, G, C, four different caps. So lean and mean swimmers, they swim much faster. You know DNA is negatively charged. If you put an electrode, a positive electrode, the anode, it swims towards it. These are capillary tube in a very small tube. Inside there is a gel. So these molecules swim towards the positive electrode because these are negatively charged. And it also depends on the size. Smaller one, this is a smaller one, goes first, then comes second, third, fourth. So there is a laser beam and a sensor. It produces this kind of electrophorogram, the graph. So basically, from a DNA molecule, you can get the sequence out of it. Are you getting the point? At least that must you please understand. From sequence, you know, a gene I can actually sequence it from my lab. So this sequence I use as a baseline to construct the tree, right? So as you know, this is a very famous photograph of our Earth taken by Apollo 17 in 1972. You know, if you look at this particular photograph, well, we all know that this is a blue planet. This is called blue marble. You know, most of the world is covered with what water, right? The ocean, 72 percentage. And if you if you zoom in any of these, you know, these location, you will see the molecules, the you know, the cells like this, prochlorococcus and cyanococcus. These are something called nanoplanktons. You know, these are nothing but cyanobacteria. We have to be immensely thankful just to these two species because the air we breathe. The air, 70 percentage of air is produced by just two species of these algae, you know. So, I think most of you have never heard this name, right, before. Prochlorococcus and cyanococcus, these are actually cyanobacteria. These are picoplanktons and nanoplanktons in ocean that produces a lot of oxygen that we, the air we breathe, that we have to be immensely thankful to this. So, I started my career after my master's at NIO as a summer fellow, that is Indian Academy of Sciences summer fellow, two month summer fellowship I got and I was with Nakhvi, current director, He's, uh, I heard he has recently been retired. Then I moved to uh, you know, IIT and finally I got a scholarship from Japan to study the phylogeography of this particular species, Monostroma kuroshiens, this particular species. This is a green algae, right? So this is an algae that I discovered. That is why the name on Kuroshiensis is because of its distribution pattern. You know, these are, this is Japan, as you can see. In Japan, there are mainly, you know, Kuroshio current, you know, Tsushima current, then Oyashio current and Liman current, the four different oceanic currents. So this species is found only in the places of the Kuroshio currents. So that is why named as Kuroshiensis, because there is the distribution of that particular algae. So this algae, I studied the phylogeography. What is that? It is actually the current distribution patterns of the algae is actually influenced by the past events, the historical events. I'm trying to trace what are the, you know, historical events that might have influenced the current distribution pattern of those algae. So uh, don't get confused. It's very simple that this algae, how different variants of the algae based on the DNA sequences. So I sequence one or two genes, then I compare its distribution pattern. So this is my study for five years till 2010, I completed my PhD. Then I moved back to India and I started working on the biodiversity of India, different places. So mostly I covered the coastal regions. So myself, I went uh, all these places, the entire coastline. The, this particular Gujarat has been covered with my students, basically. And the Odisha, this small section is still to be covered. So probably after going back, I'll cover this. Andaman as well as, uh, you know, uh, uh, West Bengal, the Sundarbans, I've already covered that one. So uh, this I started with a fellowship from uh, DST, that is INSA Inspire Faculty Award that uh, Shramik is also an INSA Inspire Faculty member. It's, a, it's an award, faculty award. And uh, DST has another famous award called Ramanujam Award, that is our Sanat. Sanat is not here though. Sanat is a recipient of that award. And then there is another one called Ramalinga Sami Reentry. That is also quite prestigious. So I have been working on this award for five years. So this is the last year. So I have actually uncovered a number of, I, I uncovered a number of interesting uh, seaweed species that is actually distributed in Indian coast. And I constructed the phylogenetic tree. So I'm, I'm going to conclude this in this year. So, 
you know, my, our results are all open source. So we have actually put a, a interesting website where each and every specimen is including linked with the primer, what primer I used, and these are accession number, the GenBank accession number. If you search it, you will get the DNA sequence. So each and every specimen is linked with the database and that is publicly accessible, including the voucher number. You know, voucher number means that, you know, exactly where this one is. You know, we have this, this is called herbarium, as you know, herbarium sheets, and each one has got number, this GenBank number, everything is interlinked. So we have that, uh, it's called DB ind algae. So we have paper, uh, you know, recently we published a paper on that. So amongst our, my major contribution is this particular algae, Ulva Paschima, that I, I found that in Indian coast. This is actually in Anjuna coast. So this is how the algae looks like. It's a new algae that we found in uh, a few years back, which we published in PLOS one. So then the next algae which we found is called Cladophora goensis. This is only in Goa, in Vasco region, you know. And uh, I found a big bloom in that area and that islands nearby to the Vasco, the Bat Island and uh, uh, other islands. So where I found this particular species, this is also reported as a new species. Then my another interesting finding is Ulvella leptoki. This is an endophytic algae, an algae growing inside another algae. So you can see here, this, is, this algae is called Cladophora. Inside Cladophora, you can see this structure, this is the Ulvella. So here also you can see these Ulvella structures here. Right, this is like algae growing inside another algae, and this has very importance because it produces something called taxol. It is an anti-cancer substance, so it has got a lot of economic value as well. And this particular endophytic algae, not just Ulvella leptoki, but any endophytic algae in Indian Ocean, this is the first report. Never been reported in the whole Indian Ocean region. So again, that we published in Journal of Biosciences, that also got some uh, media attention. This is another. Epiphytic algae, so this is called Erythrocladia. There is a, as you can see, this is a red algae growing on the green algae. That is epiphytic, so this is epiendophytic algae. So this is also a new species that we found, but we haven't actually described yet. It's still on the process. You know, while naming it, we have to follow a certain regulations, you know, uh, nomenclatural standards. So to get it published in a high impact factor journal, it takes time. So we have to actually do that and you know it's actually about the referee, review review process. So submit a, a paper then got rejected, mostly it's getting rejected. Then you resubmit to another journal, that, you know three, four times the review, then only it takes really long time for a paper to get accepted. This is very interesting phenomenon that we found here, you know in blood rain, they call it as blood rain, the rain which is red colored, you know and this has been reported since time immemorial, you know, even in the Iliad, Homer's Iliad, you know, the Greek classic, uh, the epic. So this particular thing, this phenomenon happened in South India, that is my place is in Kerala, so there are reports in Kerala in 2012 as well. So it's like mostly like after two, three years, this phenomenon happens in Kerala. So in 2012, we got some samples and we actually, you know, there, there are a lot of explanations, especially if you look at the post here, Huffington Post is written, extraterrestrial theories explored for unexpected Plain fine. So, extraterrestrial people were saying about it, or even divine manifestation. So, we collect the sample, and we, you know, of course, we could see the spores in it. You know, these are all algal spores. This is something called Trentipolia annulata, and we did a <coughs> barcoding, and we confirmed the identity, and then we, of course, we published that. So, we were able to unravel the blood rain mystery. So, this is what I told you earlier as well. This is the Osimum tenuiflorum that is Tulsi. So we got samples across India and we could actually see that there are two haplotypes of the Tulsi, haplotype 1 and haplotype 2, that is A and B. Uh, as you can see, this B is basal to A. So it is actually from B then to A. So it's actually from this, then it is actually dis distributed to other places in India. So that confirmation we could be able to get it. I'm also working on mosses in the Indian Himalayas. You know, we collected different mosses and we got very interesting findings here. Very a number of new varieties of the mosses in uh, Himalayas. We are also working on the mangroves from the Sundarban as well as from Kerala. You know, interesting findings we got. These are called the phylogenetic trees. You know, and if you see that these are our samples, and sometimes it doesn't actually form to any conventional. You know, the barcodes available in the GenBank or NCBI. So it is. It could be a perhaps a new you know, OTPs. 
cryptic speciation in ficus religiosa is another very interesting thing ficus religi religiosa you know that is the people right the people plant so we could see that there are two kinds of people acuminate and aristate varieties you know and these two varieties form two entirely different clades and we got it the samples from across in the including andaman and nicobar islands so you can see andaman is mostly the second second variety that is actually aristate variety this is ficus bengalensis that is our banyan tree that is our national tree again we could really <coughs> see that there are two haplotypes of that right one is actually mostly northern haplotype here while these are the second haplotypes distributed but there is no geographic identity of this particular thing it is distributed quite randomly here north as well as here on the uh, you know in the west bengal and orissa area there is a haplotype b i just missed the what is the meaning of haplotype the variants gene variants. variants yeah this is like one type is located here another type is located on another side you know these are more related these red dots are more related than blue dots so related as in your family for example your first cousin is more related to you than the second cousin or the third cousin right genealogical relationship so these are more related than this yes so two haplotype means they are basically two, two varieties genes. two varieties of the same gene. same gene yes this is this is what the tracking trails i told you this is very important tool the phylogeny is very important to trace the dispersion routes where exactly it's spreading you know this is a very famous species called capaficus alverazi for karajina you know it's a food additive so it has been uh, you know uh, we are cultivating this capaficus in or off the coast of uh, kanyakumari you know for a long time now and but where exactly this capaficus is invasive species and where this where does this capaficus came from so we got the capaficus from all around uh, different locations like goa gujarat karnataka kerala tamil nadu and andhra pradesh from delhi now the the pattern is very clear here in the base the most nearest place is veravali then comes goa then karnataka kerala tamil nadu and ap you know, if you see that in the you know in the map it's actually from the gujarat it's it's being you know dis distributed elsewhere and that is what people have been hypothesizing for a long time because this particular species is introduced to a lab a csr lab in bhavnagar you know for research work and they simply throw out the spores or culture media and then it got introduced in gujarat then from there it started actually you know uh, distributing to different other places of earth i mean you know, or indian subcontinent naturally so secondary dispersion is natural but the first one is deliberate human introduction oh, excuse me i'm just how you are uh, finally saying that means i'm still yeah just trying to find out the tracking trails yes. so you are saying the sources from vera or some place yes gujarat so somewhere how, in the gujarat how do you which way actually you identify that it is from gujarat yes. or something yeah yes what is the method see we simply sample the same stuff from all over all coast, places okay yes. and i sequenced okay. one gene yes then i constructed the tree this is all statistics basically okay. statistical probability based i'll explain that later okay. and once you have a tree whatever the isolate near to the base is the you know the uh, probably the geographical origin of that particular species from there it is being spread to elsewhere this one you see the branch length is too high that means it is evolved a lot here the branch length is too less so that means the evolution evolution rate is very less so if this is the origin this is very less evolved it's more related to the ancestor are you getting the point So for example so chimpanzee is our ancestor right and if i make the tree of human being you know africans are more related to the chimpanzee not really chimpanzee is not our ancestor <coughs> but chimpanzee and human being had a common ancestor that is the uh, the the right way to put that up in a human tree we could see africans more closely related to the ancestor of the chimpanzees then comes we you know whatever it is you know there, there are a lot of controversies but up to this is very clear now it's actually from africa that you know human beings have been originated but here it is actually the whole diagram is actually very interesting here because of the the gene that is actually low evolving gene which is we we used it as for this particular 
inter internal transcribed sp spacer. These are gene sequences we used for uh, you know constructing this tree. Then comes another interesting finding is sargassum zangi that previously referred only from China. So this is a Chinese uh, sequence available in the gen bank. We got it from Havelock that is in Andaman as well as from Mandabam that is from Tamil Nadu. And this is the first report of sargassum zangi in India. Never been reported, no, forget India but nowhere other than China. So it is definitely introduced. So you can see that Chinese species is this. Sargassum zangi in Havelock is more closely related to the Chinese one. Then comes Mandabam. So probably it is actually natural dispersal mechanism from China through Andaman to Indian subcontinental coast. So this also we published this finding last year and this yeah. was featured up. You know some of you have read this particular story. And other than that, you know, uh, uh, because I was living in uh, Japan for a long time, so I also speak and write Japanese, I also teach Japanese in my university. So if you look at the medieval poetry, the Japanese poetry, you know, their love for seaweed is so much. You know, they actually eat a lot of seaweeds. Not merely Jap Japan, but most of the Southeast Asian countries as well as the Latin Americans. Seaweed consumption is part of their culture. It is actually shown that even in the Waka poetry, which, you know, I have actually translated some of these poetries here. Haiku, the short poetries. Five words. And this is what the paradox is. What is that paradox? Highest seaweed consuming countries in East Asia, Japan, Korea, Chile, Indonesia, Philippines, Europe, Ireland, Ulster, Ulster is Northern Ireland, that is Belfast, Wales, coast areas of US and Canada, Latin America, Chile, Peru. And now in these particular places, prevalence of these diseases, breast cancer, colorectal cancer, coronary heart disease are very low. So the, uh, there is definitely, there might be some clues, you know, because of their habit of consuming a lot of seaweeds. And now there is another interesting paradox called French paradox. You might have heard of that particular term. French paradox is that French, you know, French people eat a lot of red meat that produce a lot of cholesterol. You know, uh, HDL is good, but LDL is really bad, trans also, trans fat too. Still, they have the least coronary heart disease. Why? Because now it is proven beyond any confusion that it's because of the drinking habit. They drink a lot of wine, red wine, which contain resveratrol, that is a phenol, a uh, natural occurring phenol that, you know, that, uh, that is actually having a lot of, you know, coronary protective abilities. So that is the, actually that link. Here it is a seaweed paradox. So I have written a project to Minister of Earth Science, same funding agency that is supporting our work as well. Uh, it's a major project called Drugs from Sea. So I'm the PI of a project, so uh, a, a very interesting natural products from seaweeds, which is anti-cancer. So we are screening, uh, you know, the natural the seaweeds, that is actually the algae, extract the algae, different kinds of extract, against different cell lines. Not exactly the medic, you know, the patients, we are not searching, we don't have any authority to do that. But we have cell lines, cell lines are cancer cells grown on the lab. You know, like for example, HALA is a famous cell line. So if you, if you can see that this extract is working on cell lines, it can try for a higher level, that is the animal study. So we can do that <coughs> step by step. So we are actually working on the cell lines for these drugs from the algae. So that is actually one of my major projects I'm, I'm doing on. I'm also working on a number of medicinal plants from India. For example, these are all you know Ayurvedic medicine plants. So these uh, DNA barcodes are not available for most of our medi medicinal plants. For example, Sarpagantha, or Shankapushpa, we don't have a DNA barcode. Barcoding is also very important to ascertain the taxonomic identity. For example, a, a, you know, a herbal formulation is coming that, you know, that actually says it is actually from Sarpagantha extract. It could be any extract, it could be added color. So there is no proof that it is actually the Sarpagantha. So how do you do that? If you have DNA barcode, you can actually take the DNA sequence out of it, no problem, even though it is extract, you know, even though it is ground extract you can take the DNA out unless it is cooked in heat for a long time if you cook in the heat no DNA is all gone but if you grind it no problem so normally the medicines are actually ground one you know the dried ground one or it is actually wet ground so you can use this DNA barcode as a definitive proof for its taxonomic identity so the generation of DNA barcode is also very important I have a major a project from the UGC on that line. So I've been uh, telling you about my words on the life 
that is tree of life, how to, how to construct the tree of life. Life means living organisms, right? I'm also working on languages, so that might surprise you, many of you. you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a scientist, but I also work on the languages. So that is the beauty of working in a university. You can apply for a project, there is no restriction. You cannot apply for a humanities project. And uh, I'm the first guy in that university applied for a humanities project. And I got sanctioned as well. So this, this is actually from, uh, you know, Indian Council of Social Science Research, ICSSR. That is a, one of the big funding units <coughs> of social science research. So biological evolution and linguistic evolution are very closely related. And it's not I say, it's actually from the Darwin, see if you have read The Descent of Man. Even Darwin was perplexed by that, curiously parallel, how languages evolve. Languages evolve with respect to the geography. Geographical isolation makes some language separate from the, the parent one, you know. And it's actually discrete characters, lexicon, so I'm not actually explaining everything, but linguistic evolution and organic evolution are very, very interesting and very curiously parallel. For example, species goes extinct, language also go extinct, new species comes up, right? So that is actually origin of new species, new languages also comes up, cladogenesis. So hybrids, we have plant hybrids, language creoles form, drift, you know, and social selection and natural selection, all this happens very, very yeah, interesting. So uh, this is actually some uh, clock, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, construct, I'm working on, you know, Indian scheduled languages of India, 22 official languages. So how do I work? For example, I work with the cognate data set. This is a comparison of different, different languages. So, one example is that number system, 1 to 10, Malayalam, Tamil, Kannada, Tulu and Telugu, you know, these are actually from Dravidian language families, right? So I make this kind of data set, then I binary code it, you know, uh, I can I can, I can can use uh, some letters also, related, you know, for example, Onnu, Onru, Ondu, Onji, Okati, you know, I can actually put this number and even this, I can do that using phonetics, I can speak on it, then you know, uh, there is a software called Audacity that produces a graph <coughs> and this graph I can compare, statistical graph comparison to call which number it comes from, you know, that way I can do that. So that is what I actually do. Now this numerically coded data set I give it to Mr. Bai. So it's nothing but a Bayesian statistical reconstruction, what it does. So Bayesian theory, not explaining very, uh, you know, uh, uh, it's, it's a bit complicated, it's in statistics. So it's something like, you know, they consider that the probability of an event depends on, partially on, your prior judgment. You know, so one of my favorite an analogy is that you ask your daughter, you have a workshop, you ask your daughter, go and pick up a screwdriver. And then after one minute, she comes and says there is no screwdriver. So, will you believe her or not? So it depends on your prior judgment, right? It depends on many factors. Screwdriver could be very small so that she might miss it. If it's big screwdriver, if she says so, then the, you can believe her. It also depends on my workshop, if it's tidy or untidy, right? So another analogy is that if you watch a lot of trailer before going to a movie, you know, and you expect it's gonna be a very nice movie, then the movie has to do a lot of hard work to impress you, right? Also your relationship, getting married, you have a lot of expectations of your future wife. Then get married, chances are high that you will be sad. <laughs> <laughs> but you, you marry without any expectations, zero expectations, then chances are high that it will be you know, more better. So the same way here. So it's all about the prior conditions, you know, it's actually it about the prior problem. So using this particular immensely useful tool, I construct the tree. Of the, la the language, so in you know in South Asia we have got seven different kinds of language families, out of which three are more prominent in India. You know, Dravidian family. This is my research. Okay, so you can see the Dravidian family. You can see Kannada and Telugu have almost similar script, but they are not similar at all. And Dravidian family, you know, Dravidian family. Most of the linguists are from Tamil Nadu, and they say the Dravidian family, the big brother is Tamil. That is also incorrect. It's actually Telugu, as per my study. So 